you as Greg. Uh, I will introduce you as Greg. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. okay. Um, so welcome back. Uh, next up is Greg with uh, you, the, TPM, the problem TPM2 solves. Uh, TPM2 is actually an, a topic that is dear to my heart. Uh, I spend a lot of time with TPM2, so I, I'm very interested in what Greg has to say about it. So welcome, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Chao Kui Hong. Uh, in Taiwan, I use the ID Zixun Ren Quan Gui. I teach at Taoyang University, and I'm also a board member of Software Liberty Association Taiwan. And today I'm going to talk about uh, TPM2, a technology that Microsoft Windows 11 require your computer to have. And it is not for your benefit. That's what I want to tell you. Um, because I um, maybe made an incorrect estimate. I'm not sure I, if I can finish my talk within 30 minutes. So uh, I invite you to um, take your QR code scanner and look at these two URLs. On the left is the slides of my talk. On the right is an article I submitted to uh, GNU.org. Um, so TPM2, uh, by the way, uh, I should first emphasize that I am not a, I'm not quite a developer, okay? I write some programs, but I'm not quite a developer. And especially, certainly not a uh, uh, firmware level developer. I look at this problem mostly from a social perspective, a societal perspective about freedom, about user freedom. That's where I, that's how I look at this problem. So, um, if I don't have time to finish it, then I'll just tell you the conclusion first. We are going to be assimilated, okay? Maybe it's not ourselves, the human beings. Uh, maybe it's more like uh, the appliances in the movie, um, what's the movie? G-Force. G-Force, that's, uh, that's an old movie. Okay, I, I only uh, have old movies in my mind. So, anyway. Um, so our appliances, our smart TVs, smart phones, uh, smart toilets, smart whatever, okay? In the future, those will be assimilated if TPM becomes pervasive, and I most likely I think it will, uh, then that's what's going to happen. The, all the th computers or the smart stuffs will be uh, remotely controlled by the lords. And who are the lords? Uh, the, the companies who want to enforce things like digital rights management, okay? So let's begin with digital rights management because that's, that's the motivation behind uh, the, de the design of TPM2, in my opinion, the, the way I see it. That's the uh, original motivation. It began maybe at around, um, 2005 or so. Uh, no, this one. No, okay, uh, okay. So it began at around 2005. If you look Google for uh, Sony Rootkit, for example, okay. Um, so you'll see stories about how um, Sony wanted to enforce copyright protection. Um, and also you could Google um, fair use for WM. That's fair use for Windows uh, Media Player. Okay. And you could probably add a few more keywords to look for the stories that happened during 2005 or 2006. So Microsoft Windows tried to enforce copyright um, uh, on, on the user's computers and people are not happy, happy about it. And they tried to um, reverse engineer and try to 
get away from this um, digital rights management. And by the way, um, if you look at the name, digital rights management, that right is not about your right. It's not about the right of you as a user. It's about the right of the copyright holders. So that's the reason why Richard Stallman at the Free Software Foundation uh, calls it digital restrictions management instead because uh, for the users who owns the computer, it's not, uh, it's not a right management, it's a restrictions management. It, it decides how you are going to be restricted uh, in order for you to behave well, in order for you, the user, not to make a copyright infringement. So that was wh where it began. And it was not very successful because um, the computers are in our hands and we can do anything we want with our computers. We can, we can run um, emulators, for example. We can run debuggers. We can do reverse, engineer, er, er, reverse engineering on our computer in order to break uh, digital restrictions management. Um, so how does digital rights management work and why is it always why did it always fail? Because in the normal security model, we have a uh, sender of a message and we have uh, the recipient of the message. And also we have the third person, which is the attacker. In the normal security model, when we do encryption, um, A, the sender will encrypt the data and B, the recipient will receive uh, the encrypted message and then he will somehow decrypt it. The attacker will also see the encrypted message because the encrypted message is supposed to run over the internet um, without um, other protections. Everyone will be able to see the, the encrypted message. The only protection over the encrypted message is the, um, the password or the key that B holds uh, that can uh, decrypt the message. So that's the normal uh, cryptography model. However, um, the, di the digital rights management uh, guys, they are facing a very different problem. They uh, send their content over the internet or over whatever channel to the consumer. And the consumer is also the attacker in their model. In their mind, the consumers will probably make um, uh, unlawful copies of the digital contents, right? So the attacker is the same as the consumer. And that's the reason they cannot um, use the ordinary, the uh, correct, um, security model, cryptography model, they must invent something else to, to enforce DRM. And the only thing they can do is security by obscurity, which is code obfuscation. That is writing a code which is hard, uh, intentionally made uh, unreadable by any other um, programmers. And this does not work. Okay, this um, is, as I said, if you have the computer in your hand, you, f you have physical access to your own computer, uh, you can always do reverse engineering and all that kind of thing. And this is going to be defeated by some uh, genius hacker. And therefore, DRM always failed. So that's what happened um, like seven or eight years ago. Uh, and it's not just for digital rights management. There are other applications that provide some legitimacy of centralized control by big tech. Big techs, okay? So um, for the past two years, we have this um, COVID situation. And um, as you may know, in the universities, um, we have to do remote exams, okay? And when the teacher administer remote exams, how do the teacher 
make sure that the students are not uh, are not cheating. Okay, how do you make sure that um, that is the case? So, if so, there are um, very there are several companies which create software um, for online proctoring, and it's very restrictive. Um, the students have to install such software in their own computer, and basically the software becomes a rootkit, um, uh, something that has total control over your computer, because it will not allow you to, for example, if you are taking an exam online, um, it will not allow you to, to open a separate tab, right? If you look, open a separate tab, you might be able to surf the internet to look for answers. It may not even allow you to open a s different window if you, if you, um, the browser restricts you from doing anything else, but you open a separate browser, then you will be able to cheat again, right? Or it may not even allow you to run a um, virtual machine. If you run a virtual machine, then every restriction can be, uh, it's only limited within that virtual machine. And the students can still do something else outside the virtual machine, and then he will be able to cheat, right? So that's something which uh, motivates or gives the big corporations some excuses to have control over your computer, over everyone's computer. And there's another thing, game cheating prevention, okay? When we play games, we don't want, uh, we want the games to be fair. So we want to, we don't want other people to um, use uh, plugins, extensions that help them uh, gain uh, advantages over us um, unfairly, right? So these um, examples, these uh, situations are examples where uh, it may have some legitimacy for the big corporations to say that um, you, all the users, should hand over your freedom, your uh, sovereignty, your, your control over to us, okay? We will take control of all of your computers in order to make such things uh, more fair. We will prevent uh, cheating in remote um, exams. We will prevent cheating in game um, playing and we will enforce copyright for all the authors which all of you might someday become, right? And therefore, please give, give your rights over to us. Give your control on your computers over to us. So that's the basic idea. Now, um, before we go um, into TPM2, I want just to make sure we are on the same page with regard to um, um, biometrics. Okay, may I ask um, who uses um, fingerprint login or to unlock your phone or whatever? Does anyone use fingerprint? Um, okay, thank you. So if you use fingerprint um, to unlock your phone, I strongly um, uh, recommend to you to Google these keywords. Fingerprints are usernames, not passwords, all right? Uh, there are at least two articles who, which talk about uh, this topic. Fingerprints are usernames, not passwords. Think about it. If you have, um, if you, uh, so if you lose your password, what do you do? You change your password, right? If you lose your fingerprint to someone, if your fingerprint is in some database and that database is breached, and it's, it's been, it has been sold on the black market. What do you do? Well, you change your finger, right? You change to, I'm sorry, uh, no, uh, you or whatever, right? So after you use all your 10 fingers, what do you do? You start doing this. It's not, it, it does not look good, but you, you, you have 20 options. <laughs> so that's not, uh, I mean, if you use retina, it's even worse. You have only two options. Right? And if you use face, there's no other option unless you go to a surgery. It's, it's, for, 
It's a surveillance technology. It does not protect you, all right? If someone knock you out, if you protect your, um, if you protect your phone with a password, he will not be able to get anything when you are unconscious. However, if you use biometrics, then your phone can still be um, unlocked. So think about it. It's not a, um, it's not for your security. It's a surveillance technology. But um, I'll just stop here. So suppose we are on the same page. We agree that um, biometrics is not good for your sovereignty, for your freedom. Then we can move on and we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, cryptography, okay? So I'll make it very simple. And actually, um, the picture on the right-hand side is, is a very, very good picture I found on the internet. And it explains um, asymmetric cryptography very nice. Um, so the traditional cryptography is on the upper left corner, all right? You have a box and you have a key and you use the key to lock the box and also the same key to unlock the box. That's uh, symmetric cryptography. On the lower left corner, it's uh, asymmetric cryptography, meaning um, you have two keys. You use one key to lock your box and you use the other key to unlock your box. That's the basic uh, working of asymmetric cryptography because you use different keys for locking and unlocking your box. And one key is called the public key, the other is called the private key. If you use the public key to lock your box, then you must use the private key to unlock it. If you use the private key to uh, lock the box, then you must use the public key to unlock it. Um, <coughs> now, it, it has two applications in, uh, in the real world. One is for encryption, where uh, the sender used the public key to encrypt a message, and then the receiver used his private key to unlock it. And there's a second application, which is what we will focus on in this talk, which is the sender uses, uh, sorry, uh, someone uses his private key to sign to create a digital signature. And then everyone else in the world w can use the public key to verify the signature, all right? So that's how a digital signature works. And that's also how um, TPM2 works. You see, this gives us a very good um, protection. It has been around since uh, 1980s, or I don't remember exactly. Anyway, this is a very good thing for um, security, from, for, for at least for cryptographers. Um, they usually rec recommend using um, uh, cryptography, using encryption to protect your data. Now, uh, the big corporations, they turn the table around and they are very smart. They create something called trusted platform module. Um, so the trusted platform module, um, it has a lot of keys and to be honest, I, as I said, I'm not a developer and much less a firmware developer. So I don't really follow all the details. But the key point is um, for the ordinary uh, public, pub public key encryption, that's another name for asymmetric cryptography. For ordinary public key encryption, uh, the person who owns the key, okay, so the key always come in pairs, right? It always, so if I run software on my computer to generate a pair of keys, I will have the public key and the private key, and I'll keep the private key private, of course. No one else will see it. I will publish my public key on Twitter, on my blog, or um, whatever, social media so that everyone will be able to use my public key to send messages to me. And the message encrypted by my public key can only be decrypted by my um, private key. And that's how we keep communications um, safe. 
um, so, but in the TPM2 case, they create, um, they create uh, keys in, so in the chip, in the TPM2 chip, they uh, have pairs of keys and these keys, you don't even have access to your own private keys. That's the key point, all right? All right, suppose, uh, I mean, uh, I hope this is, this is the most important thing that I think many people ignore. We as users, we do not have access to our own private keys. That's the whole point of TPM2. Now, you can only use your TPM2 chip to, to create digital signatures because you own the circuit. You own the circuit, so you can do that. Um, but you don't have the private key and therefore you cannot, for example, you cannot um, send your key to someone else, all right? Um, so basically, that TPM2 is, the TPM2 circuit is pretty much like the fingerprint of your, of your computer. It's like the biometric of your computer. Um, so in the future, it will be like a real name or rather pseudo name uh, world for computers to be on the internet. Every computer will be uniquely identified and you will not be able to fake it and you will not be able to run virtual machines to fake it or whatever, okay? It's unique uh, because of the public key um, cryptography. So, uh, for a very uh, real application, for example, um, previously Netflix has this problem when someone registers for a Netflix account, that person may share uh, the passwords with his friends or relatives, right? Um, and then several people will be able to use the same account to log in to watch the movie. In the future, this will not be possible, all right? Um, but I'm not saying that I encourage copyright infringement. I'm just telling you that uh, what can be done and what cannot be done. And it's, it's something that cannot be done in principle, in mathematical principle. It's not, about, uh, it's not about we are not clever enough. No, it's, it's by mathematical principle. Now, there's another thing that um, I, wa I want to talk about. It's called um, PCR. It has nothing to do with COVID. It's, uh, it's called Platform Configuration Registers. And uh, again, I don't know exactly how it works, but from what little I uh, understand from the reading, I will use this analogy. It's like a train, okay? So TPM2 is, is the um, locomotive, and it uh, carries all other um, cars. So what does it do? Well, uh, imagine you use the, this train as a prison, okay? It's a, it's a comfort, comfortable prison, a luxurious prison, just as Windows R or um, Mac R, all right? Um, but uh, you want to make sure that the users will not be able to tamper, uh, to, to, to get away from the, the uh, train. And what do you do? Well. This is not very good because there, is, there are gangways, right? The gangways, if you leave the gangways open, the users will be able to insert their own cars. They will be able to run their virtual machines, for example. They will be able to run uh, uh, core boot, Libre firmware, for example. And then they will be able to defeat you, whatever restriction you set up. PCR is for this purpose. If you look at the uh, specific or, or articles, if you look at it and you think about it, they have very strange um, dis designs. Like you can only reset the registers, you can only append the registers, you cannot write uh, to change certain registers alone, right? So uh, this guy's uh, article is very nice, um, Gabriel Sebin. He says that um, all copy protection systems try to control what your PC would do and were always defeated because we could reverse engineer it. 
Remote attestation by itself permits your PC to do almost anything you want, but ensures your PC cannot talk to any services requiring attestation if they don't like what your PC is doing or not doing. So that's the situation now. Um, so the um, cloud, so every cloud service provider uh, will have as much rootkit power over your computer as allowed by the platform, by the platform owners. And by the platform owners, I was talking about um, Microsoft, but also Google and Apple. That's the operating system people, they will have control over um, the, um, what they allow you to do. Okay. Um, and just these past few days, we, I see um, the talks about Google's WEI proposal. That's um, web uh, environment in web environment. Um, what was that? Anyone knows that? Okay. So that it has been very controversial uh, in the past week. And actually, it's not just about Google. The, Google. the reason Google is able to do that is, if you look back, it's actually based on TPM2. Um, maybe it's not perfect right now, but eventually TPM2 will make that very, um, very secure or in, their, in their eyes. So um, what will they be able to do? Well, um, maybe they can require all apps must, must come from Windows Store uh, and they can require all apps must respect DRM. They can require all apps to respect telemetry um, and then competitors may be expelled from the Windows Store or uh, they, will may, they may have m much less justified restrictions over your computers. These are what uh, the, the, the Lord can do um, so what do we do? Um, well, we can, um, we can move to some other cloud services that does not require um, remote attestation, okay? Or we could uh, avoid cloud services um, as much as possible. So that's the only solution I see right now in order for you to run whatever software you want um, in the future it's not going to be um, it's not going to, do, to be easy to run whatever software you want if you are using um, the services or one thing you could do is probably I don't know maybe you could run containers okay maybe but I'm not sure exactly maybe the PCR will prevent you from running other containers so um, there's an article um, here this article uh, there's a, a so this is a research article, and one thing I learned from that article is that fewer system configuration options will be available in the future. And therefore, our computers will look more and more alike. Um, I mean, my computer, I run Linux, so... Uh, but most people, when they run Windows, uh, they already look much alike than our um, Linux um, ecosystem. But in the future, they will look more alike because, because uh, if you want, you can read this paper. And that's in st stark contrast to biodi biodiversity, which is more healthy environment. So that's um, what we will see in the future. And I don't know what to do. And also, it doesn't help if, if Linux supports um, TPM2. I mean, there are projects, there are open source projects um, that enable Linux to run TPM2, um, but it only allows us to be um, controlled. I, 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 don't, I don't see um, any way out, except if you don't use um, cloud services, which I also don't think is completely possible because um, there are many governments or university um, services that require you to use cloud services, okay? So I don't know what to do, I just want to make a point, make people start thinking about it. Um, it's not only about technology, it's not enough for Linux to support this technology. It's this technology in itself will force the entire um, world to run on less 
uh, individual computers, it will be more uh, centrally controlled. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm working on trusted computing since 15 years. So I did a talk about the uh, digital, uh, digital rights management 15 years ago, about especially these topics. So um, the intention was in the beginning for sure the digital rights management, but they figured out it's not working even with the TPM. So that thing is, I think, not the, not the stuff what they're doing currently. Um, I think also the TPM is more like a tool like a knife, you can use the knife to stab someone and kill him, or you can use it to chop your vegetables, right? So it always comes with like for what you use it. And for sure there are services like trying to identify devices that can be good, that can be bad, depending on what the service does. You can also have that for identifying your, your computer system against like the, the company infrastructure to make sure there's no breach that no one connects who is not allowed to connect, right? So there's like security application, there's also privacy application, there are multiple applications for TPMs nowadays. So that's what I see as a like deep in that topic over 15 years. Uh, for sure it's a problem with digital rights management, I completely agree if it can be misused, it, it might end up in that situation. Um, but this is also like you can change companies or like this is a political uh, or human problem, it's not a technology uh, problem, I would say. So, but it's good to raise to see someone raise these questions because this is the opposite side, right? So, I only for for myself, I only think about the benefits of TPMs. We make tra a system transparent, which is quite important if you can see what is running on the system because this gives you transparency. Even if you're running like open source stuff, right, on it, you can if you can see what's running there. It's like really good for for ma um, making sure it's really what you want to have run as a cloud service. So, but um, for sure it can be used also for other applications. Yeah, that's just my opinion on that. So, but thank you. Um, I just want yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just uh, really nice talk on that. Um, I would maybe chiming in a little bit on that, but I was really curious from a Taiwan perspective what the policy makers are doing out of this, because I think really this is coming back to policy and governments, because in the end, like this is a, like the, there's only so few OS manufacturers, right? We have Apple, we have Google, we have Microsoft, guess what, they're all Americans, right? So it's more like a, geo, a geopolitical question, and we see some governments like Korea, for example, they were very successful in pushing back on Apple and saying, hey, guys at Apple, other people, like Korean companies, should also be able to create app stores, right? So, and they're forcing Apple to open up. And I think this is what every country has to do. It's really, really important. Otherwise, we will be in, in this domination land. So maybe my question back is, is in Taiwan something moving there? Is, is this something that politicians are aware of or are moving on? Like, I, I'm really curious about that. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, I cannot answer for the Taiwan government but uh, most likely they have no clue about it um, because most people, not even the government, um, not even the professors, I suppose, they have no clue as to what TPM2 is. And, um, and that gentleman is right. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it depends on who uses this to do what, right? It can be used for good things and it can be used for, for bad things. Um, but most likely it's going to be the the three OS companies, as I said, they will have control over what is allowed and what is not allowed. And if you are not happy with them, then it's fine. You can just use your precious little Linux, which can get you nowhere on the cloud. Um, so that's, that's the situation. So the way I see it is um, probably less about having our um, country, having our own uh, operating system or central control. The way I see it is um, is centralized uh, world or a distributed, uh, the, the, the powers, is it centralized or distributed? Just like what's, what's happening, what has happened for the past few weeks with the um, Twitter, right? People, m uh, ex has an, there's an exodus from Twitter to other more decentralized um, social media. So, and, and the reason we, I am in the free software community 
um, is because we have more decentralized um, uh, power system. Um, so that's what I'm uh, shooting at. And this uh, is more for, so there are technologies that are in principle more, uh, give you a more centralization of power. For example, uh, nuclear power, right? Nucle nuclear power is intrinsically centralized. And uh, the wind, uh, the wind power, um, the, the solar power, the, the it's more uh, decentralized. So that's, that's what I'm, yeah. So, so I also think it's important that we create open technologies, right, for, for that to, to, I mean, we, we can have these, like, hardware-based security technologies. That's what the special word for that is, right, because it's a security chip. So, and there will be more in the future, there's already, and there will be more hardware security-related technologies. You don't see it's in built inside your processor. I know that because I'm working on firmware, <laughs> so we see all that stuff, right? And that's why we're working in the open source firmware field also to making these stuff more open because it's like it's a big problem that is already built in into your machine you don't see it you don't know what it is and in order to gain transparency on machines and have this control and you can keep control of your systems right as an owner probably or as a company who owns the stuff then you have to know what's in there and so we need to provide open alternatives which are, for example, open source TPMs. We need to have like the software stack completely open. And if we have everything open, we can control it ourselves. We can build it ourselves. In an absolute reverse case, we have our own, our own infrastructure. And this is currently even possible because it's getting cheaper and cheaper to build hardware. So it will be in the future not so much, yeah, it will be not that hard anymore to build complete open systems in the end, if we get to that point. And that's your private key. And that's what I encourage you to think about. All right? Thank you.